So, our next speaker is Ellen Heber Katz from uh, the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. She's here to talk about uh, regeneration of tissue in mice, which is really cool because one day we might be able to apply that research so that when I lose a limb, and I say when, not if I lose a limb, because I'm just that kind of guy, um, it will be a minor inconvenience instead of a totally life-altering event. So would you please join me in welcoming Ellen Heber Katz to the stage. Well, now I understand why they made me get rid of all of my mitochondria slides. So Lance, I have to thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about this mouse that we've been working on for between 13 and uh, 12 and 13 years. And it's got a lot of interesting properties. And um, uh, hopefully it will lead to uh, the ability to regenerate in mammals. Okay, now. So, um, first I want to uh, mention that um, there are multiple ways. After an injury, there are multiple ways of healing. Uh, perhaps the most extreme way is um, epi called epimorphic regeneration. And um, this is uh, multi-tissue the, the total limb or whatever the structure is comes back and is completely functional. And basically, this is what you see in amphibians, the, the super regenerators. Uh, the other extreme is um, scar formation, where you cover the wound the best you can. And um, that is seen in, um, in generally in mammals, although the, the degree of scarring varies. Um, Nope. What's going on here? Okay. Um, uh, now, the newt, this is a, a uh, picture of the newt. And um, what you get is the formation of this structure called a blastema. It's a, a population of cells that are thought to be dedifferentiated. They proliferate. Um, they um, grow and um, no. Where is the pointer? This is not. Okay. <laughs> ah, good, 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 good. Okay. Um, so you can see that um, I can't see, but you can see, hopefully. Um, um, that he, so here is the blastema growing, and it continues to grow, and you get a new limb. It's, it's smaller than the original limb, and it eventually grows to complete the complete size, but it does, it does form. So this is, this is what the newt can do. Now, there are examples in mammals of a type of epimorphic regeneration, and that's seen in the um, uh, deer antler, which grows, it forms a blastema, uh, it continues to grow to full size, and then it falls off and it starts over again. So this is, this is considered epimorphic regeneration. It's also um, true that um, in rabbits, if you make holes in the ears of rabbits, um, a blastema forms around the rim, continues to grow, and when, when it closes, you get new cartilage, new muscle, um, um, again, multiple tissues that form perfectly without scar formation. Now, um, in 1996, I was an immunologist. I was working on autoimmunity. And um, we started working with a mouse called the MRL mouse. And um, this mouse is, uh, has been used for, I mean, at that time, it was almost 50 years that it was used for, for uh, autoimmunity studies for a model of lupus. 
And um, we actually were using it for, for another study, but autoimmunity, and we ear punched these mice. And a few weeks later, um, so this is just to show you that the ear, ear punching is a standard model of um, marking mice, because in mice, unlike rabbits, um, the holes remain for the lifetime of the mouse. So you, you can look at the mouse at any age and you'll know who, who he or she is. So this is what we saw. Um, here is the MRL mouse, we made a hole, and uh, three weeks later, the hole was gone. And um, um, this is, the time is variable, but, but it is consistent. Um, whereas this is what you normally see, the hole remains. So we were so amazed that, um, and over time, the hole completely, uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that there was anything there. We were just so amazed that we said, okay, we had to find out what's going on and um, ended up really giving up our, our uh, uh, immunology studies. So I became a regeneration biologist. Of course, that's what I thought. But anyway, um, we looked at other things, obviously, uh, besides the ear hole. And um, we looked at myocardium, not being cardiologists. Um, we uh, used a cryo injury instead of an ischemic injury. Um, and a cryo injury actually leads to the death of cells. So if you take a cold probe and hold it against the heart, cells will die. So, so in this way, we could find out whether we could get replacement of those cells. If you do that in the B6 mouse, which didn't close its ear holes, you can see that there, so this is the right ventricle, and you can see that there is scar formation, at least at this level. So there's um, no tissue, um, no live cells here. Whereas you have the, um, the MRL mouse, which actually replaces its cells. And we know that because we've done um, incorporation of, uh, of uh, uh, BRDU, a, a, um, um, a DNA synthesis um, marker. And um, we also did functional studies. These were um, blinded studies. Um, um, which were done, and it shows that the, the uh, right ventricle gets large and then gets small again. We looked at digits, and we found that if you cut the digit, and this is um, it, right in the middle of the, of the, so it's the second part of the uh, finger, the second bone, um, there is almost no growth in the um, non-healer, in the B6 mouse, but we see some growth in the healer. And it almost looks like there is a joint that has formed. And you see proliferation of cells. So we don't really see a complete digit that has formed because there's some strange things that go on. After this growth is seen, the cells die off, and then they start growing a new, um, a new tissue again. And this is, it cycles. So there must be something that it's missing. But this mouse is able to do that as well. Um, uh, other groups have also shown that if you make a hole in the cartilage in the knee, so articular cartilage, um, it grows back. And also if you look, um, there are other examples, but also if you look in the brain, in the hippocampus, they're actively um, dividing neural stem cells in these mice as opposed to the control mice. So these mice really have a lot of unusual properties. Now, when we first saw this, we said, well, how are we going to find the, the molecules that are really involved in um, this regenerative response? And we thought that, that genetic mapping would give us the answer. Well, that was in 1996, and here we are in 2010, and we're just starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but um, th these are the first studies we did. We have been using, um, so let me just say that the MRL mouse is a, is a, has been bred by a combination of four different strains of mice. One of those strains also is a healer, so it contributed the phenotype to this mouse. And this is the mouse that's called the large mouse. 
Um, so, and we have been working with Jim Shevrud at Wash U, and he um, has made these advanced intercross lines, and now we're really starting to see, um, to, to really get to the genes. And he has also sequenced these two strains, so um, um, we're in good shape. Um, but we still ha don't have a gene from, from these experiments, or genes. Um, so, uh, we have, uh, so we looked at also at the biology over, over um, these years, and we found that there were three interesting biological effects that we saw that, that could be perhaps approached in terms of therapy. Uh, one is that inflammation, um, a type of inflammation, um, uh, is important for um, the regenerative response. I mean, here you have an autoimmune mouse. It's got an inflammatory response going on. And, uh, and in a way, it's not surprising that inflammation would really be key. Now, I'm not really talking about a chronic inflammation, but something acute. Um, and so we're really looking at um, um, some kind of intervention that, um, or enhancement of the inflammatory response that might yield to uh, enhancing a regenerative response. Now, we know that if we use a anti-inflammatory, uh, specifically a COX-2 inhibitor, it blocks ear hole closure. So what happens when you come in with an injury, you take an anti-inflammatory, that eliminate, probably eliminates regeneration. Okay, now, the mitochondria. So, um, it turns out that this mouse has unusual metabolic properties. This mouse you, is, is more glycolytic and does not use mitochondria. So maybe Lance would say they're half dead or almost all dead. These, these are really happy mice running around. Um, they are fat and they don't metabolize fat very well. Um, they rather store it. But what um, Otto Warburg found was something called aerobic glycolysis. So, so basically you have oxidative phosphorylation um, that is, is going on in the mitochondria. And, um, if, uh, and most of the ATP is produced by the mitochondria. But there is another kind of metabolism that doesn't require um, um, mitochondria, and that's called glycolysis. And uh, aerobic glycolysis is what you see in the presence of oxygen. So what Otto War Warburg found was that tumors most tumors use glycolysis, aerobic glycolysis. Um, uh, these are rapidly um, dividing cells, and, um, um, and, and this seems to be important. Also, embryonic tissue, obviously, low oxygen. Um, they use the glyco glycolytic pathway. Also, stem cells use glycolysis, and, and it's been shown that amphibian regeneration also um, uses glycolysis as well. So we found that if you look in the MRL mouse, um, if you look in heart tissue, liver tissue, um, cells from the ear, they are glycolytic. So this is a picture of um, cells from the MRL mouse, the healer, and the B6 mouse. This is the mitochondria which we believe uh, they have low membrane potential. There's very little reactive oxygen being made. There's a lot of lactate being made. Um, the mitochondria are sort of circling, sitting on top of the nucleus. They don't really seem to be doing much, um, but they are sitting there, and there are also more of them that are found, than are found in the B6, which are, uh, you can see them uh, diffusely um, distributed within the cell. And this is the uh, microtubule um, skeleton of the cell. And um, you can see that this is very radial. It really uh, um, hasn't made a decision in terms of directionality as opposed to the B6, which looks much more polar. So it looks like an immature cell. Stem cells look like this. It looks like a very immature cell. And um, um, uh, 
we're not sure exactly what the mitochondria are doing here. We think that what's happening is that these, these um, cells are, these, these mitochondria are ready to go. They're increased in number, and when the time comes, they'll be turned on, but we haven't actually shown that. Okay, so uh, can we block gly uh, glycolysis and what happens with ear hole closure? In fact, we have done that. We've used a drug, uh, DCA, which actually is used um, is a, an anti-cancer drug. Um, and sure enough, well, here is, um, this is the first 15 days. This is the degree of ear hole closure. And um, um, this is the normal animal, and this is the highest concentration of DCA we're using, so it's not, the ear hole is not closing. So um, this is uh, also, now this, this is interesting, and you can't really see the head, but um, uh, this is a marker for, for glycolysis. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the molecule HIF-1-alpha, but this is, and these are mice um, that are um, report, HIF reporter mice. And they have been back crossed to either MRL or B6, and um, they've been ear punched. You can see the ear punch, and there's very little activity in the, in the uh, ear of the non-healer. Um, this is probably the, the lung. There isn't a lot of activity here. Interestingly, the MRL mouse is loaded with it, uh, this HIF-1-alpha, which actually induces glycolysis. And um, um, here you see it in the ear. You can't see the head, but the head is really hot. So, so here, these are either very um, stupid mice or very smart mice. They have loads of proliferating uh, neuronal stem cells. And um, uh, so you can see that, that this is um, a property of the healer mice. So we are actually trying to upregulate um, HIF. Um, we also know that there is a molecule that's missing from the MRL mouse that is involved in degradation of, uh, of HIF. And, um, uh, we're trying to uh, downregulate that. So it's another way of trying to induce a regenerative response. Okay, and the third prop biological property that we had looked at was the, um, the cells from the ear uh, are very rapidly growing. And we um, thought that we, we should look at the cell cycle. Now, the cell, the cell divides and keeps stopping um, at different stages, there are cell cycle regulators, proteins, and um, to check the DNA, to make sure that there are no damages um, that, that um, are, are uh, carried through. And, um, and the cell, once the cell stops dividing, then it um, tries to repair. So what did we find? The, the non-healer cells from from the um, B6 ears are slow proliferating cells, and they seem to be present in G G0, G1. So after the cell is divided, it stops and um, uh, before it goes on. So most of the cells are in G0 and G1. And um, however, the healer cells amazingly have all of these cells in G2. So why would there be so many cells in G2? We looked at uh, DNA synthesis, and we used something called a comet assay. And this is a single cell um, that um, shows a lot of DNA damage. It's basically embedded into a gel and run um, um, against a, um, in an electric field. And um, the broken DNA migrates. If it's not damaged, then it stays as a sort of a blob. And you can see that the non-healer the non has almost no uh, damaged cells, but the healer has almost 90% of the cells that are um, um, show, show comets in this assay. Um, so what, what would we predict? Why, why is this going on? Why, 
why didn't it, why didn't the cell pick up this damage? Why didn't it stop in G1? What does it do? What are these cells doing in G2? And um, so we looked for a molecule that's involved in uh, G1 arrest um, um, and um, imagining that there would be a defect in these cells. And we looked at the molecule P21 and sure enough, the MRL mouse is lacking this protein. These are controls. This is a human cell line. This is a, um, the B6 non-healer. So P21 seemed to be an important molecule, um, as if this P21 molecule was suppressing the regenerative response. We were lucky that um, the Jackson Laboratories had a, a P21 mutant where the P21 doesn't exist. Um, this was made in Tyler Jack's lab. And um, we asked, does this mouse regenerate? And sure enough, um, this mouse, um, so this is the control, the background control, um, the ears don't close, the ear holes don't close, and here the hole closes completely, and it looks very similar to the MRL mouse. So this could be the gene that, that really is, uh, re at least this gene is responsible for regeneration. Is this identical to the MRL healing? There may be some differences, and we have to look at multiple tissues, um, look at the same systems we had looked at before. But um, our next step is to try to, so, so this is the whole mouse. This is a mouse lacking P21. We're, we're certainly not going to eliminate P21 from, from individuals um, by knocking out the gene. Um, so we are collaborating with uh, Bob Weiss at uh, UC Davis. And um, he has synthesized a small molecule which blocks P21. And we are now testing that in vitro and in vivo um, to see if we can block um, um, this molecule and induce a regenerative response. OK, so what are, where, uh, what else are we looking at? Well, we thought that um, there may be other um, cell cycle regulators that, that are important. We have gone, we have a collaboration with people at the um, um, Mouse um, Model of Human Cancer Consortium. We are going through all of their strains. Um, these are essentially tumor suppressors. And um, so far, we found, besides the P21, that P19, um, which is ARF, and um, um, uh, I don't have it here, but TGF-beta um, are both involved in um, uh, ear hole closure, and we assume in general regeneration. Now, we've looked at P53. It does not, so the, the P53 knockout does not um, regenerate, but when we bred it back to the MRL mouse, so if you knock out P53 in the MRL, you get enhanced regeneration. So what you get is faster um, uh, ear hole closure. You get um, um, a, a higher frequency of complete closures, and also you get a greater uh, differentiation response. So what we, what we imagine and from multiple experiments that we've seen, there's a biphasic response that's occurring. First, um, um, you have your proliferative phase, and then you stop, and your cells start to differentiate, making a complete organ, functional organ. Um, so it looks like P53 is involved in chondri enhanced chondrogenesis, which, which um, is important. And um, so we're doing that with, with, as I said, all of the mice that we can at the consortium and also uh, crossing those to each other to see uh, what the effects are. Okay, now, um, finally, um, this, was, this actually was a title of a paper that I wrote several years ago, Does Continuous Regeneration Lead to Immortality? And um, it seems that the hydra, I, the hydra is often considered to be an, an organism that's Im, 
essentially immortal. It keeps dividing. It doesn't have any, the, the um, cells don't seem to slow down. You have um, sloughing off of old cells and replacing um, the, those cells with new cells. You get bud formation, so you're, you're uh, getting a re regeneration. You're getting new hydra. Um, so, you know, could this be possible in a mouse or a human? Obviously, that's where we're going. Um, so, what, um, um, when we look at the MRL, how long does it live? Um, and unfortunately, the MRL mouse is an autoimmune mouse and it dies of autoimmunity. We ha actually have bred mice to eliminate that autoimmune response. And those mice do live longer. They, they, so the MRLs live for 16 months. And these, these congenics that we've made um, with healing genes, MRL healing genes on a B6 background, um, live to about three, three years. It's good, but certainly not immortal. Um, uh, and what do those animals die from? They die from autoimmunity, which of course brings me back to the role of inflammation, which we think is really key. Now, what about the P21 mouse? The P21 mouse, uh, it's interesting because it's, P21 in some cases is considered an oncogene. In some cases, it's considered a tumor suppressor. It has multiple functions. The P21 knockout mouse doesn't get cancer like uh, most of the other um, tumor suppressor genes which get cancer ver at very young ages. The P21 doesn't get cancer until approximately 16 months of age. And what do the P21 mice get? They, they get an inflammatory autoimmune disease, which is important for the um, tumor microenvironment, and they end up dying of tumors. So how can we really separate these, all of these events? Is inflammation really required for regeneration? Can we bypass that in some way? Um, uh, you know, in terms of tumor generation, um, can we get by that as well? Um, and uh, let me just say that there was a, a, a very nice paper that came out last week from um, Helen Blau's lab uh, looking at mouse myotubes. So that actually, um, that they considered that a model, um, their model of regeneration, it's in vitro of course, but the two molecules that they found that were important were ARF, which is one of the, the um, mice that we found that could regenerate, um, and also RB, which is directly downstream from P21. So we would predict if we get rid of P21, we would get rid of RB. Um, but they ha also have a problem with induction of tumors. So can we separate tumors, inflammation, and regeneration? and um, live forever. Okay, thank you. Hello? Yes. Yeah, you really have me confused on inflammation. So if I injure myself, should I be taking an anti-inflammatory? Yeah. Uh, I, if you want to regenerate, I would say no. <laughs> Not confusing. I mean, let me just say that remodeling is also really important. What inflammatory cells do is they bring in enzymes that can remodel tissue. Um, some of the molecules like uh, matrix metalloproteinases are blocked by um, antibiotics. So it may be that <laughs> antibiotics as well um, um, will block a regenerative response. I mean, we have shown that specific ones do, you know, whether they all do, I don't know. But double-edged sword. <laughs> yes. So the fact that amphibians regenerate seems to imply that somewhere in our evolutionary history we may have also done this. And I'm curious if you've had any insights as to why we might have evolved to not do it anymore and do scar tissue instead. 
Well, I think that a lot of people believe that um, scar tissue um, is really a fa faster response um, that covers over a wound. That actually isn't true because um, during regeneration you get a rapid epithelial covering of the wound. So, so that should not be an advantage. I mean, I think that the issue of glycolysis, it's not usually seen. It's not in the adult animal. Um, you need oxygen for maximal ATP production and, um, uh, and uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So I think that that probably plays a big role. Um, if I can talk, yeah. Oh, uh, is it possible that in the quest for immortality we're running up against the physical laws of entropy and something that fundamental? <laughs> Anybody have an answer? <laughs> I was going to say, wrong yeah. speaker to ask, Pat. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, uh, so you talked about kind of simpler model organisms and um, like Hydra and, and sort of, you know, regeneration in those cells. What sort of parallels are there in terms of like cell cycle regulation or differences between uh, you know, those model organisms and, and, and the mouse. Well, that actually that. sent us in the direction of cell cycle because it turns out that the hydra, a lot of the cells in the regenerating parts of the organism where, where the, um, the budding is occurring, mm -hmm. those cells are in G2. Right. And um, so that's why when we, you know, looked at, the, uh, looked at the cells in culture and saw that there was G2 arrest, we were really shocked. Now, the percentage of those cells is, um, you know, as I said, those cells are, are proliferate, pr proliferating very rapidly. And um, uh, so there are some of the cells, and there's DNA damage in almost 90%, so some of the cells are not, are, are not stopping. They just keep going. And some of the cells are arrested. It's been shown in Hydra that those cells can differentiate. So those are important. Uh, so, so is G2, is there something important in G2 that's going on? And that's something we're looking at. Right. So it's a, definitely a parallel between what we see in uh, the, uh, the uh, Hydra and what we see in, in the MRL. Are there, are there any other simpler sort of model organisms which ha ha also have regenerative properties which are useful? S simpler than the Hydra? Well, or kind of other, other model organisms which have regenerative properties which are also kind Show of Show that. Um, I, I think that the, um, I think it's been shown in Planaria. Um, I think it's been shown in um, um, newts. But um, I, I also think that, you know, it was an idea that came up and sort of uh, went out of favor and, and people stopped looking at it. So we were, re you know, as I said, we were really surprised when we looked at these cells and saw that they were in G2. Okay, cool, thanks. One more question. Have you done um, any experiment about the regeneration of the central nervous system in these mouse? No, well, uh, I shouldn't say no. We actually um, have looked at optic nerve, and we do get um, axonal growth through complete transections. Um, but, you know, as I said, the, um, there are neural stem cells that are actively dividing in the hippocampus of these mice, and, uh, and, I, and I definitely think that, that it should be looked at. I mean, neuronal, the, um, CNS um, should be looked at. Yeah. Thanks.